Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show for your Monday, the 18th of July. An exciting session to behold. We had a uh, nice choppy market today. Later on, I will actually walk you through some of the silver adjustments that I made. As you guys know, on a Friday show, I was telling you how uh, I was going to be put silver come Monday morning. So I received my silver and, of course, sold some options against that. Made about 3.5% rate of return for the next 30 days. So uh, not too bad. Getting paid to hold silver. And if it goes up too much, hey, just take that silver away from me. So greetings, everyone. Happy Monday. Uh, we're going to have a fun session. As I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I was like, we're going to get Bill Addis on after the Fed announcement on the 27th, just to because I, it's always so timely to have him on. However, we just couldn't wait because there was so much going on. <laughs> You're hearing a lot about the 1% uh, you know, potential rate hike. So I figured we would do a bond market update with Bill Addis. Of course, he's joining us live today. So Bill, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Merlin. Always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Good to meet, talk to your people. It's good to have you back on the program. Um, I guess we could start off high level. Um, you and I have been talking for, well, years, but about this specific yeah. topic, I think going back into, let's say, July and August of last year, even into September was, you know, we're going to have two rate increases for the entire year of 2020. And then it was, well, we might have more than two. And then it was, 25 basis points. Oh, and then we'll bump it to 50. Uh, now we're about to 75. And now you're hearing, you know, 1%. I, I think that if anybody from the outside who looks at this, it, it's clearly the Fed saying, uh oh, we're, we're kind of behind the curve here. We need to be extra aggressive. Give me your take on the 1%. I mean, I haven't seen one. I don't think I actually have seen one in my lifetime that I've been following the markets, but you think we're going to get one? And what does it mean for the market? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think 1% is just a number. It really is. And I think, unfortunately, the talking heads just seem to spend so much time every day. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be 75? Is it going to be 1%? And, and, you know, I think the last meeting showed us, you know, the Fed was only going to do a half a point hike. We know that right up until the week before the meeting. And then that huge CPI number came out and that changed the scenario. And suddenly we were at 0.75. So, you know, we, we still got another two weeks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I do think that 1% is easily achievable because I'm still of the camp that inflation is nowhere near contained. Um, so I, I think 1% is easy. But, you know, I, I'm an old veteran. I remember days of, you know, 700 basis point hikes by the Fed back in 1980s. And those are the comparisons that people are drawing. So, no, I don't think 1% is out of line. I, I will say, though, it seems like the, the odds of that are waning as the week goes on. You know, last week, if you looked at the futures markets, it looked like about a 90% probability mm -hmm. of 1%, and that's now down below 80. So yeah. the market's getting whipsawed. It's um, a, you know, it's funny. The number, the number. Yeah, it's funny, Bill. You said that it was, it was literally like at 90% for like 15 minutes when as right. all the bond shares. So I actually have it up here right now for anybody who's looking at home. This is the Fed Funds Futures uh, targeting the probability of different rate hikes for the 27th of July. You know, last week, there was a big shift up mm -hmm. above uh, 1%, but it's currently kind of where I expect it to be. I personally think it's going to be 75 basis points. I think it's kind of admitting uh, that they're too far behind here, and, and we'll discuss commodities in a minute, but 69% chance right now of a 75 basis point increase on the 27th, a 30.9% chance of a full one-point raise at that meeting, and that's actually up over yesterday's number. So it's slowly inching its way back up there in probability. But, but this is the game the press likes to play. And I, I personally, I don't, I'm not sure I, I like playing this game because we still have all this data. And as the Fed keeps telling us, give us a chance to see how this plays right. out. Right. So, you know, when we start, you know, at one meeting, as soon as one meeting's over, we start doing the odds of the next meeting. Um, <laughs> let's, let's follow the Fed. Let's give this a chance to work because, as we know, we are in that magical, unprecedented territory here That's economically. True. That's true. Well, I would I would just add a little asterisk there saying, screw the press. I, I who could care less about what the press says. They're, they're always pontificating and they have no skin in the game. But uh, the Fed Funds Futures is actually real traders with real money right. on the line. So exactly. I have a little more uh, credibility with those guys and, and their prospective targets when they actually have money on the line. Absolutely. Um, but as, as you show, day to day, those percentages and odds are changing dramatically. Absolutely. And, you know, and then a lot of that is media driven and fear driven and speculation. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a more definitive readout when it gets there. So you, you think 1%? Is that 
solid? I, I think it's conceivable. Yeah. Again, I don't want to I don't want to play the odds because we still got three weeks of data before the number, and I think the Fed could be swayed at the last minute. I'm worried about inflation, so I, I'm going to err to the upside. So yeah, I'll go to one percent. All right, all right. Okay, we'll we'll uh, we'll have to have another beer on that one next time I see you. I'll take seventy five basis points. Uh, you're buying me a beer if that happens. If it's one or higher, I'll even give you one and a quarter and oh, above. Jeez, yeah. that's how <laughs> like generous so I am. Outside, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Eric asks a good question. He says Reagan's Volcker raised rates uh, one to four points in the early 1980s, and it killed inflation after a small recession. Question mark. Yes. That's true. And yeah. it did. And unfortunately, as history shows us, and I'm going to be pessimistic here, every time we've had this problem of stagflation, yeah. the answer has unfortunately been going into a recession. Mm -hmm. And the question really at this point, I think, is just how quickly is the recession going to come and how deeply is it going to come? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we're going to talk about next, the yield curve's inverted as of this week. Bond market's predicting a recession. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the unfortunate reality is we talk about the idea of a smooth landing, that the Fed can somehow magically thread that needle between cutting out inflation but not hurting the economy. Sounds great. Yeah. But the reality is it's never worked. We've always gone into a recession. Let me ask you, I mean, you, you, you seem to think that we're headed towards a recession. I'm of the school of thought that says we are in a recession at this moment. Right. It seems to be a very contentious uh, topic. You know, you hear some people on TV going, absolutely not. And you hear, you know, Powell and other FOMC members saying, well, the probability is increasing. It's like, well, aren't we there? I mean, two consecutive right. quarters of negative GDP growth. You've got inflation is surging. I, w w what am I missing? No, and, and this is fr my personal frustration when I hear talking heads say, you know, well, there's a possibility we might be in a recession or approaching or going into one next year. And as you and I have talked about, you know, the definition of recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. Well, GDP was negative last quarter. Yeah. <laughs> so we're halfway there and GDP doesn't look like it's any better for this quarter. So, you know, the reality is we're probably in a recession. Now, believe it or not, there actually is an academic organization, I went to have the name for us, that actually does the official ruling. It's almost like the NFL playbook as to what is a recession. There's actually an organization that kind of decries we're in one. Um, and people are starting to talk, well, maybe we should add employment as a filter of recession. So uh, it's getting a little bit more nebulous. But you are right. Economics 101, two consecutive quarters, you're in a recession. We're probably there now. Yeah, I think so. By the way, it's the National Bureau of Economic Research is the one. Thank that you. There has to be some government agency out there that's getting paid, you know, a whole team of six-figure individuals to officially put us in a recession. <laughs> I picture them with this big rubber stamp, right. you know, stamping, you know, recession, <laughs> here we are. We're officially there, okay. We're officially in a recession, that's right. Um, but, you know, but the reality is, you know, the yield curve is inverted. So the bond market is telling us we're, in a, we're going into a recession. And that only officially happened this week. So let me uh, take a step back just for clarity's sake. Um, you know, the industry, again, there's lots of definitions the industry likes to label things. And right. most media outlets will say, oh, an inverted yield curve is the 10-year and the 2-year. And you corrected me last time. You said it's actually the 10 and the 1, right? Right. So that... Yeah. that and, but, and honestly, again, no, no definitive rule here. But mm -hmm. the Fed talks about 10s versus 1s. So I like to do that. I won't dispute that You know, many people look at the 10s versus 2s. Other look at the 10 versus 3 month. Mm -hmm. you know, so that there are different benchmarks that you can use. I tend to look at the 10 versus 1 only because that's the one that Powell talks about or, okay. or the Fed talks about. So I'm going to see, I actually, uh, I had it up here, but walk us through, uh, let me see if I, you had some charts here to bring up. I want to talk about that yield curve and I'm going to see if I can bring up on my screen a, a slight modification of that one. Sure. Let's go to, so there's your yield curve now. This is the most recent one you just sent me. Great. So the blue line is tonight's yield curve. We were where we were at noon today, New York time. And what you can see is the one year and the two year and the three year for that matter are higher yielding than the 10 year. You know, we are getting a yield curve inversion. So whether you want to talk about it as the one or the two, either way, we're inverted. And that only happened last week um, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And as I keep saying, I, you know, I have to be honest with you. This is where I'm having a crisis of faith because I'm a bond guy. And, and the bond guy going inverted has always been a clear indication to me that we're in a recession going back you know, to the four of them that I've experienced. But in my soul, I really want to believe that inflation is going to be going higher that we haven't yet licked inflation because, you know, the dichotomy here is what's going to be happening to long-term rates. Right. If inflation is still the problem, long-term rates are going to continue to go up. If we're going into a recession, long-term rates are going down. 
And that's the whipsaw we're seeing for the last two weeks, right? You're seeing this huge volatility in long-term interest rates, seven, eight, nine, ten percent, 10 basis point change in a day. And that's because the market is living number to a number trying to figure out where we are. I, I personally, the fact that we're inverted, I have to be true to my history because the most dangerous words in finance are this time is different. Yeah. <laughs> so if the yield curve goes inverted, I, I got to be in the fan that we're going into a recession. Uh, yeah, you know, there's a phrase I love, which is everything works until it doesn't. And if the, right. if history has shown that like every single time this goes inverted, it, it's a recession. Well, I'm, I'm rolling the dice and I'm taking that bet anytime. Uh, let me show the viewers out here real quick. <clears throat> so this is the 10 versus the two year and anything below the zero line here would be an inverted yield curve. And you can see that uh, the 10 and the two year have been inverted for about two weeks now. Here right. is the 10 and the one, which Bill says is a more accurate measure of it. And we're still for about the past week, we have been underneath that zero line, which means we are officially in a recession. And then we also did one with the, the longer term, taking the 30 year and the two year, which, you know, 30 years out, you should be getting a higher yield, right? You're, you're investing your money for 30 years. Give me a greater rate of return. It's negative right now as well. It's, it's just barely under uh, negative, but it is an inverted yield curve right now. So I wanted to share those three things with the viewers just so you can kind of see what's going on there. But I'm, I'm going to throw out a different scenario for a moment because I, I'm going to kind of hedge my bet here because <laughs> I think quite likely what could happen here is that the long end of the market is going to continue to exhibit the schizophrenic up and down. You know, when we get a number that's inflationary, rates are going higher. We get an economic number that's recessionary, rates are going down. And when we're playing that whipsaw. So what if long term rates basically remain where they are, but the Fed continues its vigilant move to address inflation and continue? Continues to be aggressive. You know, they've told us they're going to raise rates five times. Yeah. You know, for the next five meetings, and you know, as we're debating already, how much that is. But you know, look at this chart. You could easily see short-term interest rates at four percent. Oops, so yep. we could get inverted, not because long-term rates are going to go down, but because the Fed is going to have to be as a, oh, maybe overly aggressive as we talked about, and have to really raise the short end of the market up. So there's going that could be the cause of the inversion. As it already has been. Right. Uh, you know, a couple of good questions here. And I think uh, I'll start with one from Robert. He says, why increase rates if we are in a recession? Well, uh, the main reason that, they that they're forced to increase rates is because there's three vehicles or three mechanisms, uh, at least the mainstream, that are used to control inflation. Number one is you reduce money supply. We'll talk about that in a second. The Fed is actively doing that to the tune of 90 billion. You have raising interest rates, and then the last one is gonna be raising the reserve requirement for banks, which they kind of have done in a roundabout way, but not officially for normal deposits. But they, their job right now is, number one, let's get inflation under control. If they don't, things really go to hell in a handbasket. So that's why they're raising rates, which that'll affect the short term end of the yield curve. But the long term now is dependent on supply and demand, as Bill has pointed out. And that's what's causing it to go inverted. The prospects for 30 years or even 10 years, it's just not that great. So why would you invest your money for 10 years when you can make more on a one year or a two year bond? That's, that's the reason that they, they're forced to raise rates from inflation, and that's what's causing the inversion of the yield curve. So, and, and to Robert's question, you know, that's the whole problem and the conundrum of this problem we're experiencing of stagflation. Right. You know, this is an economic anomaly. You know, normally it's a strong economy that causes inflation. So the two normally go hand in hand. Now we've got high inflation and a weak economy. Those are normally don't go together. Mm -hmm. So for the last two years, every central bank in the world, and the Fed included, has been doing things to stimulate the economy. With the full knowledge, it was probably causing inflation, but they had to worry about the economy first. That's what QE was all about. Right. Now our Fed, like most central banks, has said, okay, having done that, now we have to turn our attention to inflation because it's rearing its head in levels we haven't seen for 40 years. Yeah. And that's the switch that our May Fed made last November. So now the Fed is now has a different target, inflation. Mm -hmm. And in ringing out inflation, unfortunately, they are going to cause further pain to the economy. And that's why I say, unfortunately, every time we've had this stagflation problem in history, the result has been a recession. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Les asked a good question, too. And I'll, 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 ask, I'll ask you two questions to help explain this one. But Les says, you know, what's, what's causing the short-term rates to be going up faster than the 10-year? While we get to that, 
explain you, you, had, you were using hand gestures, but basically, you know, the Fed was looking to stimulate the economy. And you, this hand here was representing the, the short end of the yield curve, and you pulled that one down. Explain right. that action. How does the yield decline so aggressively? And, and what, what's the goal of the Fed doing things like quantitative easing and bringing that yield down? Great, great question. So I'm using my high tech visualizations <laughs> here with my hands. Um, the short end of the market here. The short-term interest rates looking at this yield curve are directly manipulated by the Fed. They own short-term interest rates because if you look at this picture, back in 2020 and 2021, the Fed had dropped the Fed funds rate down to zero. See, this chart starts at one month because that's the shortest maturity that the government issues. But if we wanted to bring this into one day, the one day benchmark we use for risk free rates is this rate we've talked about called the Fed funds rate, the rate that the Fed sets that banks borrow money at. Well, before the pandemic, it was up at one and a half percent. Then when the pandemic hit, they dropped it down to zero, where it's been for two years. Because again, the Fed was interested in stimulating the economy. They wanted to make it cheaper and easier for the banks to borrow money, that that would translate through to the economy. But now, since November of last year, the Fed is saying, whoa, now we have a different mandate. We got inflation. So the Fed has started raising that Fed funds rate. That's the rate that we're talking about. Are they going to raise by 1% or three quarters? And that's literally just the one day rate of interest. But so that, you know, just think of the physics of it, right? The shorter you have to maturity. And the Fed has told us they're going to raise aggressively. And that's what the bond market is pricing in, mm -hmm. right? Look at how much that one year yield has gone up over the last year from zero to 3% because the Fed has told us they're gonna keep raising rates. Right. So the Fed basically controls and owns the short end of the market. But going to the question, I forget from the person's name, great question, that has nothing to do with, for example, what the 10-year treasury might yield. Right. right. What long-term interest rates do are the function of very different considerations, mostly supply and demand. So that's what QE was all about. Back during the pandemic, when the Fed brought down short-term interest rates, that helped. But then the next weekend, they said, we got to do even more. So let's print up all this money, buy all these long-term bonds to drive down long-term interest rates. So they had to affect supply and demand by creating all this liquidity, printing all this money to go out and buy all those bonds to drive down prices, uh, drive down yields, right. drive up prices. Now the opposite is happening, right? The Fed is raising short-term rates, and now they're doing this thing called tapering, which is the reverse of quantitative easing. They're starting to destroy money. And that should put upward pressure to interest rates unless we're looking at a recession in which rates might go down. Mm -hmm. Therein lies the conundrum. Yeah, and, and that there you go. I and mean, that's that's exactly what I was looking for with regards to an answer. You know, you have um, why is the short end spiking up? It's because your biggest buyer of it is now not lo no longer buying. In fact, they're unloading them, right? And they're going out to sell these things. And you know, when you sell that much, if you're the, if you're the holder of let's say you're the the monopoly in a specific product, and you're the one buying your own product. Hey, your share price is going to do great. <laughs> but if you're the one who's unloading that product and you're the like almost the exclusive seller because you have so much of it, eventually the buyers are going to look at it and go, oh, well, we don't want this. You're just going to flood the market. So I'm going to back away. And what has to happen is those yields have to get up to a point where people say, okay, I'll buy some of that. And, and, and we're still in that discovery process now. And we'll, maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit about uh, foreign buyers stepping in to buy some of the short-term stuff. But Les, it was a great question. And that's kind of why we are where we're at. And we're not done. Um, let, let's talk about the amount. If I remember correctly, the Fed was supposed to be, uh, boy, what was it? It was something like 30, I think 30, it was 30, 30 billion to th start. 30 billion of short term uh, treasuries. And then well, no, no, it's not short term now, just to, just to clarify more on the short end, they set that Fed. Oh, yeah, it was corporate. Right. It was so, corporate. That's right. Yeah, that's the short end. We take care of that. When the Fed was in buying under QE, they were buying all long paper. Correct. Their portfolio is a long portfolio. So you're right, though, now that they're going to start destroying money and they quickly went from 30 billion in June and uh, May to 90 billion yeah. by next month, that the Fed is literally going to start destroying 90 billion a month. Well, to do that, they're going to have to start selling some of their bonds because right. they don't have 90 billion in cash coming into that portfolio every month. Right. And, and again, so you're right. and I've talked about this on quite a bit, you know, people keep asking me, well, you know, why is the dollar going so strong? And why do you keep thinking it's going to go up? It's, it's because the Fed is burning dollars, they're removing it from supply, which is one of the actions that the Fed can do to fight inflation. But you also have this kind of a conundrum now where foreign banks and central banks are going, hey, you know what, 
like Japan, for example. I've got all this Japanese yen that is earning negative 0.1 because we're we're negative. But I can go buy some U.S. bonds now and start earning yields. So now you're actually creating increased demand for U.S. dollars. We have this very interesting dynamic right now where I think the demand for dollars is going to keep on increasing as people are trying to get some of that yield. Well, it'll be interesting to see. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I, I have to take the other side of that trade Good. a little, Marlon. <laughs> oh, yeah? Wait, you're going to go against the dollar? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is we don't. No, 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 never, never. And I agree with that. I'm sorry, I should clarify. The first part of what you said, 100% agree. You know, is it any wonder that we're at a 40-year high to the yen? You know, we're out there literally destroying currency, and Japan yeah. is still doing quantitative easing, hitting the market with new paper every day. You know, FX traders, I hope they understand this dynamic. You know, European Central Bank has not reached the point of destroying money yet. We have. Canada has. No wonder North America currencies are doing so well. Right. But but the second part of, of the, your observation is what, what I wanted to make people aware of, we're actually seeing less buyers of treasuries. Really? Yeah. Well... Because there's an interesting thing going on here. You know, if you go back to the old traditional buyers of Japan and China, right, where Japan and China were always considered, and they were at one point, in, in, you know, the biggest buyers of treasuries. Well, they were buyers of treasuries because of their trade deficit with the U.S. You know, they had a lot of dollars. So they were simply looking for safe, liquid, long-term investments. But now, thanks to tariffs, right, we don't have the trade issues with China. They don't have as many dollars. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the Chinese holdings of treasuries this week just dropped below a trillion dollars for the first time in a decade. Wow. You, know, you, you put China and Japan together, they now own less than $2 trillion worth of treasuries. And they're buying less and less as time goes on because they literally don't have as many dollars. And in the case of China, this is directly related to the tariffs that, mm -hmm. that are still in place. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong. Is if I, I believe I heard or read somewhere that the Fed at one point had eight billion dollars worth. Yes. Or eight trillion. I'm sorry, eight trillion. Yep, eight trillion. So they so, had four so. times the amount of China and Japan to put together. Unbelievable. That's how big a buyer they are. Yep. Yeah. I, that's well, that's the frightening part, as you just said. When your biggest buyer, and that's how big they were, now becomes your biggest seller. Mm -hmm. That's going to be interesting. You know, how did you, how do you, and this is obviously absolutely a hypothesis or just a speculation at your point, but, but how does that pan out? Because we have been, as a country, somewhat dependent on having people buy our debt. And right. if all of a sudden China and Japan, who were, you know, the top dogs on that pyramid as far as buying our debt, are going, we no longer want it. You know, what, what is that? How does that shift us as a powerhouse? I, I have no idea. I'm, I'm, oh, no, it's, it's, it's catastrophic, quite frankly. I mean, not, not to get too conspiracy oriented, but I'll give you my nightmare scenario. It's that OPEC goes to a euro based system, goes away from the dollar. Hmm. Right. One, one of the reasons that so many global investors are willing to buy dollars is because the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency. Right. Right. Countries have to keep dollars, you know, and the countries that sell oil, you know, pre pandemic. I used to spend a lot of time in the Middle East and Kuwait and Saudi were the number three and four buyers of the dollar of bonds because they sell so much oil in hmm. dollars. Right. But, but OPEC, let's be honest, OPEC was created over 50 years ago, and it was a dollar-based system because the U.S. was the largest importer of energy, right? We were OPEC's largest client. It made sense to have a dollar-based system. So now, as all these countries are selling oil in dollars, they're turning around and buying our bonds. That's a win-win scenario. But what happens even when OPEC decides to start trading oil in euros? You know, we're, we're an energy importer, exporter now. Hmm. We wouldn't have a, if OPEC was created today, it would not be a dollar based system. Yeah. And what happens if and when OPEC decides, let's go where our clients really are, let's go where our biggest consumers are, and that's Europe, let's have a euro based system? That would be catastrophic to us because then we've got all this debt. Who's going to buy it? Yeah. Are they, uh, are we headed there? Yeah. OPEC yeah. has acknowledged they're having conversations about multiple currencies. They won't they won't peg on the euro in their conversations, but yeah, it's uh, OPEC is looking at trading oil in other currencies. That would be catastrophic for us. Yeah, well, I mean, as far as the economy, or as far as the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar, because you know, I guess the, I well, guess the reason the, I the asked that yeah, is good question. No, the ability of us to 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 finance our debt, yeah. because it ultimately is not a question: can the U.S. borrow money? It's ultimately would be a question of what interest rate would we have to pay to borrow that money? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the bad news is right now is the U.S. government's borrowing more money than we ever have. But at least the good news is, as this chart is showing us, you know, we're doing it at less than 3% yield. That's <laughs> one heck of an opportunity from the government's point of view. For now. <laughs> For now. Well, that's, that's the key. 
Yeah. You know, go back to 1979. What was the 30-year bond coupon? 14%. Oof. Wow. 14% was what the government had to pay in 1979 to attract investors. Well, you know, and, and, you know, I guess that's the kind of the question I'm going to is, you know, where where do we end up here? You know, what what is the... I guess, what does it ultimately pan out from an investment opportunity? Because for me, I'm just thinking as I read through all this stuff and it's not about being doom and gloom or, you know, overly optimistic on anything. It's saying, okay, how can I allocate some capital and make right. more money with it as effectively as possible? And if we do lose re- reserve currency status, which uh, would probably be World War III, uh, yeah. in my opinion, is where that right. would have to come from. Um, right. You know, do I start looking at international markets? Do I start <laughs> to start buying the euro? I mean, I, it's a, it's less than parity. <laughs> It is no exactly. Oh, well, I, if I could put a, if I could put two bright spots to this, because I'm I'm starting to depress myself. So, <laughs> so if I could put two bright spots to this. Is you know, let's be honest. For the last couple of years, people who saved money were getting penalized. Right, cash paid you nothing. Yeah. And at least the good news is, and maybe it's the silver lining, is that in an inverted yield curve, the short end of the market becomes the most attractive yielding. Mm-hmm. So on a relative basis, people are incentivized to keep their money in cash, and relative to you know what what the what would you know the catastrophic scenarios we're talking about, that might not be a bad thing. So you know the inverted yield curve actually helps savers who have been penalized for years for the last couple of years. Borrowers have been ruling the roost. Maybe we can finally get an interest rate that attracts savings. Yeah. And the the other issue is, and I'm I'm going to continue to sound like a, a one note Johnny is you know when you have floating rate product like i bonds these higher inflation levels are really just more and more opportunity mm-hmm. and, and i don't want that to get lost in the translation you know we can turn lemons into lemonade there no we had you know that was a great session you did with us uh, on i bonds and you can actually he's got a video on his website as well you guys can check out where he has a little presentation he does on i bonds as well uh, it's I'll, I'll bring up bill's picture here and right underneath it you can see you've got aftraining.co so you can uh Go check that out. He's got some nice videos he puts in there to inform and educate people about there these markets. Yeah, because nobody's talking. Nobody was talking about those I bonds, and with the nine sixty two yeah. government backed yield, somebody's got to be That's making insane. people aware of it. And you've done a good job too. I thank you. Oh, you've I, been, you know, we've been talking about it on your program for over, over a year. Yeah, uh, you know, it's funny because I have not purchased any, but I'm just going. I got. I have. I have ten k, and I'm thinking, well, it's just going to sit in my savings account. I'll go buy. So I'll buy my ten grand worth for the year. It, it, well, I do want to. I do want to remind you. The only downside I see to these is you got a one-year lockout period there, so you yeah. got to be sure you don't need that money for the next year. Well, I'm pretty sure that even okay. if even if in October they reset it down to whatever seven or six or five or four, that's certainly right. better than what I'm earning in my savings account at point zero one. So. And, and the the crazy part is, you know, we've only had three months of data, but consider you know the way inflation has been going at these record levels, the, the level the next reset is going to be even higher, even if the numbers remain the same. Yeah. For the next three months. I'm, uh, I got it. I'll, I'll be the, the devil's advocate here. I'm actually thinking inflation is going to be dropping significantly in uh, October, November. And that's because if I looked at these prices of commodities, you mm-hmm. know, corn, wheat, soybean, lumber, cotton, you, you name it, between 30 and 50% declines in the last two months, which in my opinion has not factored into CPI or PPI data. So I think near the tail end of the year, you're going to get a sharp drop. I mean, it's how do you not have a drop that much with, you know, cotton down 50%? It, it's going to have an right. impact, or it should. Right. And energy prices have certainly waned also. So they, I mean, I'm not just denying there's good news out there. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, look, my, personally, I'm like, let's keep inflation high. Let's make this market struggle so my shorts do really well. <laughs> 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 yes, I'm, I'm more naturally short myself these days, reflecting my pessimism. <laughs> yes, well, you know, it's it's or funny because some people will say that it's anti-patriotic, and I'm like, no, we're in a situation that was, uh, you know, manipulated beyond belief, and here we are, you know, the piper's coming home. Absolutely. This market, you know, the, the, and I'm, I, as you know, I train at the Fed, I work with the Fed. The bond market is a manipulated market right now because of this quantitative easing. The Fed manipulated long-term rates down. It worked. Now they got to unwind that. And that's unfortunately where the pain could come in, is right. reversing what they did, which was so well received by the market. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see. Unbel or believable direction. He says, where do you go to buy bonds direct from the treasury or a broker? Depends on what you want to buy, but uh, Bill is always hammering the table about treasurydirect.gov. Um, that's where you can actually go out there and find the I-bonds. I-bonds have been you know, a real popular discussion here. If you go to individuals, I have the website up right now. You notice over here, I can go down to I-savings bond, and it'll even tell you the rate right there. You can get 9.62%. Again, you have a one-year lockup period, and you can only do 10000 a year, and it resets in May and October. So um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, just that was a great question because a lot of people don't understand bonds. Mm -hmm. um, the opportunity to buy treasuries from treasurydirect.gov, good commercial there, is you're buying new issue treasuries directly from the government through that website. And as a retail investor, you get the same price and yield as the institutional market. And you can also buy them in $100 denominations. Now, you can also probably buy them directly from your broker. You might have thought, just never thought to ask. You know, terms like Schwab, TD, Ameritrade, they all keep bond inventories that they show to their clients. So, uh, you know, if you are looking to buy an individual bond buyer, I, I'd recommend starting with the broker you might have a relationship with. You might be surprised to see that they do it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And, uh, Tom, thanks very much. Robert, yeah, for questions that come directly to us, just put a couple question marks before. Sometimes the chat gets real fast and I, I miss things. Uh, Robert says, does that mean that, you know, TLT and EIF will keep going down since the Fed is the biggest seller? So these are uh, obviously ETFs. And again, I think the easy answer there is if you expect yields to, to, um, to be falling, then though, those ETFs should actually be going up in value. If, bond, if you expect yields to be rising, then those ETFs would be falling in value. They're going to be the inverse of the yield. So I don't know if you still have the yield curve up, Marlon, but if you look at that yield curve that we looked at, look, comparing this year to last year, the TLT and the IEF are trading the 20-year and the seven-year treasuries respectively. These are ETFs from BlackRock. And you can see the yields at both 20 years and at the seven to 10-year area have gone up over the last year right? The dark mm -hmm. gray to the light blue. So prices went down accordingly. So the TLT, the long-term one, is down 25% year to date. I mean, that's a lot of volatility. Yeah. IEF, the shorter maturity, is down around 14%. So exactly as you said, Merlin, if you expect long-term interest rates to continue to rise, given this tapering argument we've been talking about, then you're going to continue to see price deterioration. Mm -hmm. If, however, you think yields are going to come down reverse direction because we're going into that dreaded recession and you think long term yields are going to go down, then you'd have to view this as a buying opportunity. So many choices. I mean, it's, right. and, I, and I guess it boils down to, you know, not the spread chart. Where was it? This is the one I was looking at. Your inflation chart here, which are 9.1 June reading. You can see we take out food and energy, which, of course, are two of the most volatile. You're still at 5.9%. Uh, and the reason I, I love this chart is it goes back into uh, some historical inflation numbers where, you know, I look back just just maybe three or four years ago, I look back at this chart and say, oh, let me bring up that chart. So I don't have it. Uh, I look at this chart and go, oh, man, it's crazy to think that inflation was running at 14% in the 80s. And we had, you know, a 16% 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And I was like, that's insane. That will never happen again. That was a one-off <laughs> aberration. And here we are screaming towards those numbers. I mean, it's really... Uh, and I don't know when we're done or how it's going to end, but, you know, it's it's been a wild ride. And I'm, I'm, I actually really do like the excitement of this current market. It's fun. Oh, it is. And the whipsawing at the long end, you know, for a trading environment, you know, that's what you want. Yeah. Right. You know, you've got you've got trading opportunity here. We've got huge volatility. I mean, this is where support, supply and demand all comes into play. Um, I think this is a beautiful trading market in the long end. Yeah, I, I agree. Tons of action. Uh, let me bring up your slide that has your... Um, the bonds are your books. So, oh uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> since, since you I brought everything, up. you got everything, including the kitchen sink. I, I always, I always liked that. Hey, you know what? You, you worked on these books, so I figure it's great to support you. Um, he's got an XLT session starting manana. So yes. for those of you who are, uh, and and what are you covering in there, just for fun? We're, we're going to get into this whole discussion again of volatility. You know, even playing off of the TLT and the IEF that we were just talking about. You know, bonds are, are a lot more analytical, mathematical than stocks. There's a reason the TLT was up more than IEF, and it's a whole concept of duration. So we're going to continue to make your audience bond traders. If you're looking to trade things like the TLT, the IEF, or even credit products, mm -hmm. you know, corporate bond ETFs, you have to understand this concept of duration. But I also want to get into even more detail what we're talking about in, in your session here about the whole idea of tapering. 
you know, and exactly what it is that the Fed is going to be doing in terms of destroying money, because as we've been talking about, it affects so many different asset classes. You know, it's affecting commodity prices. It's affecting FX. It's affecting the equity market. So I really think people have to have a better understanding of exactly what central banks are up to worldwide. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go kind of a bit micro and a bit macro tomorrow. Good. Good. I, I, I may have to sneak in and, and attend that session. I always love what you bring to the table. So look forward to it. But yeah, thank you. These uh, the books you're mentioning, I'll just throw in a quick commercial because I'm very fortunate. Uh, the summers are my busy month. And, and I just this week crossed 3000 new hires to Wall Street. Wow. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> that's um, good. It's good. But yeah, shape the them Street, right. Yeah. Well, they, you know, Wall Street hires this army of new talent out of college called associate and analysts, and then we spend the summer training them. So I'll hit my 3,000 mark of new hires. And the books that are there are our books that I use for the introductory level, the college graduates. And the author, Stuart Veal, did a good job, and Prentice Hall hired me to edit them. So I got to know Stu and the work. And they're very good introductory books. So I figured there was a way I could make these available to the OTA community. So there's, a, there's an offer there that basically covers the shipping charges if you want to buy those books. There you go. I'm not. I'm new to this hawking of books. I got. I know. I'm not a big shiller of my own stuff <laughs> yeah, as well. But it's, they're good books, and they're a great they're value. And I, yeah. I just put it in the chats so if you guys are interested. Check that out. You can see on the left hand side, uh, you get the complete investors guidebook series, which has all three of those. So you can buy them individually for fifteen a piece, or buy them all for twenty five. Hell of a deal. There you go. <laughs> all right, Bill. So, yes, uh, summer's been busy. Yeah, it's always busy for you. Uh, Margaret has a good question. Why is China and Japan not buying our bonds? Because they don't have as much dollars. They're, we're not buying as much Chinese goods and paying for it with dollars. That's what gave them all the money to buy our bonds back in the 1990s and 2000s. You know, in the 1980s, we had the biggest trade surplus with Japan. So that gave the Japanese government more dollars. So they went out and bought our bonds. When their economy waned and China became our biggest export, our biggest partner, they became the biggest buyer of bonds. Unfortunately, because of tariffs and global economics, they're not buy we're not buying as much Chinese goods. China and Japan aren't having as much dollars, so they're just not buying our bonds. See, th their buying of our bonds was never a political statement. Their buying of our bonds was simply they had a lot of dollars, just mm -hmm. like Kuwait and Dubai, uh, Kuwait and Saudi do now with oil prices being where they are. You know, Kuwait and Saudi are big buyers simply because they have dollars. They're not making a political statement in any way. So, you know, at some point, if we switch it over and let's say hypothetically, you know, Saudi Arabia and an OPEC say, let's 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 do it to the yuan. Right. Right. We're stretching out there. Then all of a sudden we're in deep doo doo because they won't be buying bonds at all. Because what are they going to be? Where, what are we going to be giving Saudi Arabia and them dollars for? We would right. actually be holding. We would have to buy Chinese debt to hold right. uh, to park our yuan. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean to be too pessimistic here, but please realize the U.S. government is bankrupt. <laughs> right? I mean, we're operating, we're operating on a, on a $3 trillion deficit just last year. You know, we've got $24 trillion worth of debt out there. And when that debt comes due, we got to keep rolling it over. I mean, some people feel, and I'm not necessarily that pessimistic, but some people feel our debt is just a ticking time bomb. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, one of my favorite websites out there is the Debt Clock. Uh, oh, that'll depress you. <laughs> yeah, let's see if I can bring Real it up here time. for you. Real-time depression. Real-time depression. And literally, like, tick for tick. But, I mean, you, you know, your national debt right now is at $30 trillion. The average debt per citizen, this blows me away. The average debt per citizen is $91,786. That is absolutely incredible to think. We have, you know, 300-plus million people. And oh. that's per person, that's what we owe. I, I know some people that are seriously in debt. Um, the one I pointed out down here at the bottom, though, I think is very telling. In 1960, uh, let me zoom in here so you guys can see this one at home. Uh Right here is what I want. It's the U.S. federal debt to GDP ratio. Oh, 19, yeah. 1960 was 52.6. 20 years later, 1980, it had dropped to 34.6. 2000, uh, 2000, we're at 57. And now in 2022, we're at 129. So, you know, and you could. We only crossed that 100% mark last year. Yeah. And it's, which is to say, when uh, yeah, we, it just, uh, we took every single economic dollar produced in the U.S and directed it towards paying our debt. It would take us more than a year, that everything, yeah. private consumption, corporate, government. And when most countries hit that threshold, it's been a real problem for them. You know, remember back in the financial crisis of 08 and 09, Portugal and Spain tried to borrow money by issuing bonds only to find there were no investors willing to lend it to them. And one of those benchmarks, which made investors dubious, 
was when their debt to GDP crossed 100 percent. We're now at 120 percent. But again, we're fortunate because of that reserve situation we talked about. We still enjoy buyers. That's not a guarantee. Right, right. Uh, and, and, and for your group out here, we have um, Tom says, Bill, how is this not a ticking time bomb? And I, I agree. <laughs> I kind of agree, Tom. <laughs> I have to agree. You know, and uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm getting too philosophical here. This is my generation. You know, this is my generation enjoyed the spending, and now I'm going to hand my kids and grandchildren the bill. Yeah, thanks. I really think that's what we've done here. Pre- appreciate that. That's nice. <laughs> hey, and by the way, enjoy taking all our Social Security, too, damn it. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, nothing left for me. <laughs> Exactly. But have fun. But have a nice life. That's right. All right, Bill. So um, so you got an XLT starting tomorrow, and I know you're doing some bond classes for OTA. So anybody who is interested, you can contact Online Trading Academy get more information on uh, his bond courses and teachings there. Again, you can see here in a condensed period of time his depth of knowledge. Uh, those sessions, but dive much deeper and give much more clarity to some of these topics. So, appreciate you coming on today, my friend. Thank you so much. Uh, Always enjoy. We'll talk post Fed meeting. How's that? That's right. I'm waiting to collect my beer when I get 75 you basis points. <laughs> All right, Bill. Thank you very much. Take Be care, well, folks. Everyone's good trading. Be All well. Right, take care. Bye bye. Yeah, that was Bill Addis uh, giving us some insights into the bond market. Is, wait for that to click because it makes a loud noise on. I think the volume spikes for some reason. I'm sure. Didn't the volume spike there, everybody? Um, anyway, hope you enjoyed that session. Bill always is just a wealth of information. I'm really curious to see what happens at this FOMC meeting for the 27th of July. Uh, right now, the forecast and the probability is 75 basis points at that meeting. And there is a, a 30% chance we're going to see a full one point increase in the Fed funds rate. Okay, let me go to a couple of questions here because I had a whole bunch of stuff uh, that I wanted to get to. Uh, I'm going to real quickly do this one because, and again, you guys feel free to type in chat if you have questions along the way, but um, I am a candlestick fanatic. I love looking at Japanese candlesticks, as you guys know. I think it's it's a reflection of buyers. It's a reflection of motion and sellers. It's just exciting to look at. So uh, Skilled Stocksman sent this one in. He says, on the silver futures chart, uh, as of Sunday morning before the futures open, is this the definition of a bullish Harami? Now, I won't read it all, but uh, basically you have this picture right here. And I will uh, double-click that. And let's assume we're right there. In my opinion, this is a bullish Harami. Why? Because you've had this long downtrend here, and then you have this yesterday fit within the, the red body. Now, do you notice it's got the small little tail that is outside the real body. For those who may not know what a real body is, that's the colored portion of the candle. Everything else, these wicks, those generally don't count. Um, so if you go to something like Steve Nissen, he would say this is not technically a Harami because the tail is outside the low of yester- of the of, uh, the 14th's real body. For me, I don't care. What, is it, what does the picture tell you? The picture tells you you had a nice sell-off, then all of a sudden you had a really emotional down day, a heavy selling day for silver, and then all of a sudden it gaps up and you have it inside the previous range. That's a sign of, and it's a narrower range, which means consolidation, a pause. And generally when you have an impulse or a panic-driven sell-off, you'll get a nice little rally back up and a pop to um, the upside. So I I like it. I would call this personally, I'd say fine, um, bullish harami and i would trade it the same way i would a uh, regular like hammer formation right i'd be looking at it with a line across the top and say if it got above let's say 1870 right there's your buy point and maybe go long on that one well today would have gotten you in and then ripped back down and potentially stopped you out so they don't always have great follow-through now on that note uh, I wanted to share this one with you because as you guys know on Friday I had our last three weeks ago I was it three or two weeks ago I don't know it's a time flying but uh, a while back I sold some puts on SLV with a 750 strike price which is right where my cursor is uh, what happened is we closed down here we closed much lower than that we closed at 1719 this morning we opened up at 1743 when it got up to 1746 I sold um, the 1750 calls so basically at price and I ended up making about three and a half percent for one month out there so very nice I'm happy that that I collected some pretty nice premium I'm okay holding the silver but if it does move up Fine, I'm going to collect my 3.5%. I, I think what will happen with silver, it's probably going to chop around a little bit, if not drift slightly down. I also sold and collected about 1.5% for 30 days, um, the 1650 puts. 
So I sold calls and puts today on silver, different strike prices. I got the 1750 calls, I sold those, and I sold the 1650 puts. There you go. Just updating you on the silver trade because I know a lot of you have been messaging saying, hey, what, what did you do there uh, with your silver now that you're exercised, et cetera. So we got that one out of the way. All right. Um, let me real quickly read this question to you, and I will certainly be watching your chat. Uh, do I ever use OHLC bars? Um, well, I mean, if you know what an OHLC bar is, that's just called a bar chart, right? So I can go here. Uh, let's, let me change this chart real quick. All right, so if, if you just do a, a straight bar chart, uh, do they even have bar charts on here? Wow, they don't have just basic bar chart. They've got a range, but that's not going to cut it. Yeah, this is totally different. Um, that's kind of bizarre. Normally, there's a bar chart on here, which has basically four values, right? Open, high, low, close. I've used those in the past, but I'd much rather... Um, oh, there it is. I don't know why that didn't show up before. Um, but see, the problem I have with the bar chart here, which is open, high, low, and close. That's really the four values it's showing you. It's hard to tell by... But a quick glance, if it was up or down on the day, especially the trends. So that's why I prefer candlesticks because it, it fills everything in. And if it closed lower than it opened, it's going to be a red. If it closed higher than it opened, it's going to be green. Makes it real simple. Um, there is also an OHLC line chart, which I do not use. It puts four lines on your chart, and I think that's just really stupid personally. Um, so there you go. All right, next question came through. What time I got here? Oh my goodness, 46 after. Um, your comment on CVX. All right, let's bring it up. So here's Chevron, uh, daily chart. Here's the details. I'll put three lines on the chart and we can walk through those. I'll draw one line there, one line there, and one line here. So I'll talk as I put this stuff together. Uh, it says entries between 137, oh, you got multiple, and 137.50, okay. Uh, let me get your stop loss on this one just so I can get that in there. 128.90. Okay. There's your 128.90. And then our target on CVX is going to be 175. All right. So these are some huge numbers that you've got on there, but we'll, we'll take it as is. Um, if we're looking at Chevron, I guess you got to ask yourself, you know, how, how are they going to perform if oil um, continues its slide? If it continues its slide, that's always going to cut into their profit margin. Oh, thank you, Margaret. <laughs> You're awesome, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, so here's the chart. I put all the values on so you didn't have to watch me type it. You just got to hear me type them. There they are. Um, you get the 128.90 stop loss. The 137 is your entry point uh, to 137.50, and the target's 175. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I, I was behind, Todd. I I was into my analysis and forgot to switch it over. So first off, I got to ask, you know, looking at this price chart, I get what you're thinking. You're thinking it's going to have a nice bounce up. You know, crude oil is going to start to move back up. However, be careful that it feels like the pressure right now is aggressively to the downside. So you're catching a falling knife if you're thinking about buying Chevron or even any of these other oil companies. Um, since you told me your demand zone, or at least your buy point is, uh, let me bring this up here, draw a highlighter, was 137 to 137.50, you know, you've got this small, little, tiny, tiny zone. I'm, I'm curious as to why that little area. I don't see anything here technically that would say this is where I want to buy, right? For me, it would be down here further, right? So maybe this for just, and this is me personally, it'd be like 136 would be my buy point, right? I'd be using this candle right here, which is uh, the candle was formed on the 14th of July. And this is just my perspective of it. So take it for what it's worth. It doesn't mean it's the right way. And you notice that that candle fits entirely within this demand zone area, this kind of sideways consolidation that happened back in February of 2022. So you know, got to ask yourself, well, where, where would the logical stop loss be? Maybe down here, like 130, so I'm already taking considerably less risk than you would be on that trade, Leonid. And, and the main reason is I'm dropping my entry even lower. So I'm saving a buck fifty on my entry, and I'm also raising my stop loss up by about a dollar twenty. So I, I've, I've removed a lot of that risk. Uh, you had almost nine dollars worth of risk. In this case, I'm looking at six dollars per um, per share of risk. Now you've got a 175 target on there. Certainly, I would, uh, you guys all see the graphs right now. You guys see now. Uh, certainly, in this situation, you know, you don't want to be thinking it's going to go straight to 175. 
for me personally, you, you cannot argue that there is an area right around 152. There's also a spot right around 145. So those other lines I put on here are now areas where you would have to evaluate um, that position and maybe take some off, maybe add to it if it breaks through it. But you know, when you when you make a trade like this and you just say outright, oh, well, okay, I'll buy it at 136 and it's gonna go to 175, that's hopium, right? That to me is really kind of you're gambling and, and just being extremely optimistic. As you've seen on almost every one of these charts, unless it's this rally that happened on Chevron back in February of 2022, it doesn't usually go from 130 to 170 without a pause, right? That was a rare event you saw back there. Could it happen? Sure. But just know normally it's not going to be a straight shot like that. At this point, you're still looking at a weak trend. We could add on moving averages here. I wouldn't use 100, but I would use something like, let's say, a 20 since you got shorter time period. So let me modify this. Um, into a 20 period moving average, and you'll be able to see it's definitely trending down, but although it might hook up right at the end, right? So it's just starting to curl. So right now, everything is saying short the rallies, not buy, which might make good reason to be a buyer here. So Leonid, um, I, I would revise the entry here just a little bit, just because I'm gonna be utilizing this candle. I'm not exactly sure what the, the, the range criteria was for you when you picked it, but I've shrunk the, the volatility here a little bit, uh, and I would give myself multiple targets. Now the other piece here is, what is the average to range of this, right? I wanna make sure that my, my stop losses are acceptable. Notice up here on this candle right here, if I ended long at 136 and had a stop loss, let's say at 130, that's six bucks worth of risk. Well, right now, the ATR on this is roughly $5. So I'm now giving myself slightly more room than the daily ATR, which would be probably a smart thing here. Um, I guess the challenge is for you and anybody else taking trades like this is, is this too much risk? You know, if you're thinking $6 per share is just too much, then trade fewer shares, right? If you have a $200 stop loss, okay, well, now you take 200, divide it by six bucks, and that gives you, uh, you know, how many shares you can trade. So we'll go, I'll bring this over here just for fun. There's, let's say you have a $200 stop loss and you divide that by uh, six. Okay, so 33 shares. You can only buy 33.3333 shares. Okay, fine, then stay there. If that's too much money for you to buy 33 shares, then cut it back to what you're comfortable with. But uh, the important part is not choking up your stop loss too tight so you can trade more, right? If I had a stop loss that was three points, I know I'm probably gonna get stopped out just based off the daily ATR. There you go. So Leon, did I hope that that helps out. Um, that is definitely more than a four to one. Well, actually, it was four to one on your values. For me, the, it'd be considerably more than that based off the revised entry area. Well, so there you go. Hopefully that helped out a little bit. Um, but Eric, you had a really long, complicated question. I have no guests on the show tomorrow, so let me let me do that. I'll go over your question on tomorrow. As you was basically talking about calculating your your ATRs, and it, it was a pretty long question. So I'll try to break that one up, uh, give us a little bit uh, more time to analyze it, since I'm near the end of the show, and that'll probably take me past an hour. So let me look at uh, the calendars for tomorrow. Here is what we've got cooking: economic calendar for the 19th. It starts to get good again. Housing. Oh, yes. I'm seeing all kinds of interesting stuff with regards to housing numbers. You also had uh, some housing data today that was not so rosy. If you notice here, we've got building permits coming out tomorrow. They're expecting a uh, decline there. And housing starts, they're actually expecting an increase in housing starts. I would think that this, since this is reflecting a month ago, maybe that makes sense. But I think you're going to see this housing starts number really decline as inventory starts to pile up. You're hearing more and more people are lowering their prices, their sell prices, and inventory is really starting to spike. Uh, a lot of deals falling through because the mortgage rates have jumped so quickly, so fast. Uh, so that would be very interesting. That's gonna be one hour before markets open tomorrow. If you're trading the Euro, which of course has been uh, part of our talk track here on this program, it's been a wild ride for the Euro. Here is the chart of the Euro. It is definitely on a nice little couple day bounce from that parity, right? We hit parity, now it's up to 1.015, call it. Um, looking good so far for a bounce, but we may see some movement there tomorrow because as I pointed out, they have their CPI numbers coming out tomorrow and they're not really doing anything to fight inflation. They're not raising their rates at all. So it'd be interesting to see what happens uh, with the CPI number for the Euro. That could create a lot of waves out there. And then if you're trading the British pound, I'll bring up the British pound chart for you. It also has had a little bit of hook. Why? Well, because we've talked about the dollar weakness, right? A pullback due for the dollar and all of a sudden, you have these other currencies starting to spike. Now, I don't know how far this dollar here is going to drop. This is the Dixie. Um, you guys see, I had this line drawn right around 107. I said we could potentially get back there. Notice, where did we hit today? 
All right. I love this stuff because it's not like I made it up and drew 107 on today. You guys can go back and check um, our Thursday and Friday show. This was the logical pullback point because that's the origin of this big demand zone that pushed up. And we hit it today and bounced right off. Now, the question is, will it hold or will we see this market drift back down and ultimately hit this 105 level? Just for posterity, I will put the 105 line on here because that will be the next logical stopping point right around 105. So there we go with your uh, British pound and the dollar index. If you notice, the British pound has a ton of stuff going on tomorrow. They have CPI numbers and PPI, RPI. I call it the Magnum PPI day. Uh, you also have wee hours of the morning tomorrow morning, uh, unemployment rate for the UK. And then um, tomorrow night after the show is when their CPI numbers come out. So there we go. All right, that will do it for today's show. Um, yeah, you know, I try not to do much with course strategy on here. If, if you want to learn course strategy, go to Online Training Academy, learn it there. This will not be the school for that. Uh, but hopefully uh, learn something along the way and improve your trading as well. So if you guys have comments, questions, feedback, you know what to do. You can put them down below the YouTube video. I will get to them on tomorrow's show as I have no guests for tomorrow. Uh, I have no guests for the remainder of the week yet. I'm, I'm working on it, but I'm busy with so many other things, you guys. I just kind of get sidetracked sometimes. So uh, that will be a... Uh, a mainly Q&A day. I've got a couple big questions I need to get answered for you guys. If you want something to answer or talked about, you can put them down below the YouTube video. Just say, hey, talk about this on your show or email me at tradermarone at gmail.com. That said, have a fantastic remainder of your evening. I'll see you all tomorrow. Take care. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. Hold up. Wait a minute. Don't be leaving. We've got a popcorn trade of the day to deal with. What am I thinking? Holy cow, I almost screwed that one up. Uh, the popcorn trade of the day for tomorrow, Netflix, guys. Netflix is going to be coming out after market close, and there's a ton of big ones. You've got Lockheed Martin, Halliburton, Novartis, uh, Citizens Financial Group, Ally Financial, Hasbro, J.B. Hunt Transport, and Interactive Brokers. So major stuff. A lot of it happening before market. The big one that, that is most exciting for me, Netflix. NFLX is your popcorn trade of the day. And that, my friends, is a wrap. I will see you all tomorrow. Serving some popcorn live on the show. Take care. See you tomorrow.